Hello, hello everyone. Uh, I'm John Adler. Today I'll be talking about fuel and scaling Ethereum with optimistic rollups. Uh, these slides will be available later on Twitter and I guess elsewhere, so so don't worry about that if, if you're interested in, in seeing them. So before we talk about our scaling solution and you know, optimistic rollups and all this, uh, first we kind of have to discuss the scaling problem. So on Bitcoin, uh, the transactions per second are limited to somewhere around three to seven, depending on the size of transactions. Ethereum can process about 15 transactions per second. Or if it's only doing simple payments, it can do maybe around 30, uh, given its current constraints. Meanwhile, you have systems like Visa and MasterCard that can process on the order of 10,000 sustained transactions per second. And we want to increase this transactions per second, in other words, the scalability of the system, without decreasing decentralization. And what exactly do we mean by decentralization? Because this is something that you know a lot of different blockchain projects uh, are very unclear about, and so on. So you know, let's let's discuss this. So there's a few potential solutions that have been proposed in both the Ethereum space and, to a certain extent, in the Bitcoin space. Uh, the older of the two are channels. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these are capital inefficient. Uh, you have to kind of lock up funds for a period of time, and this says poor UX. Uh, you know, locking up liquidity is not free. Liquidity, access to liquidity is not free. Uh, the, these things cost money. Uh, so the more capital inefficient your system is, in general, this means higher fees somewhere. Uh, channels also don't support open participation. Say you want to design a system like Uniswap, which is kind of the you know, unicorn of all DeFi contracts because it very much is completely open and completely completely decentralized. Uh, you, know, you can't do this on channels. They don't support open participation. Uh, channels have a fixed participant set. Once you create a channel with a certain set of participants, you can't change. You can't change those. You can only close a channel and reopen a new one with different participants. So income, sidechains, and plasma. You know, regular sidechains aren't great because they're not trustless. Uh, you know, whoever is controlling the sidechain can arbitrarily just steal your money. This is why sidechains are not a scalability solution. Uh, you know, plasma is a, is a flavor of sidechain that aims to be trustless or trust minimized even under data unavailability. But there's a few problems with plasma. Uh, first, it's permissioned. Uh, you know, all plasma variants, because they're supposed to be safe even under data unavailability, they're either permissioned from the get-go or they can degenerate to becoming permissioned without harming user experience uh, on the trustless side. Uh, on the on the other hand, plasma cache is the only plasma variant that is in fact trust minimized. Plasma MVP is not because of the mass exit problem, which is unavoidable. Uh, and Plasma Cache also doesn't really support open participation smart contracts like Uniswap because its data model resembles channels in some ways. Uh, there's also the problem that Plasma Cache requires checkpoints to prune coin history, which otherwise would grow forever, which means that the actual on-chain data usage of Plasma Cache is linear in either the number of transactions or potentially both the number of blocks and the state of the system. Uh, which means it can, in fact, use a pretty substantial amount of on-chain data, uh, unlike what you may have heard, where you know Plasma Cache provides infinite scalability. Anyway, so let's go over the, the scaling bottleneck. You know, what are what are these what are these solutions or proposed solutions kind of actually trying to, trying to solve? So the scaling bottleneck. You may have heard a common talking point that, for example, EOS or EOS is more scalable than Ethereum and Bitcoin because it's centralized around 21 block producers. Uh, but this is wrong. And you'll see in this picture on the right here from Daniel Larimer, who's you know heavily involved in, in, in EOS and things like Steam and other delegated proof of stake systems, uh, you'll see that EOS has 21 block producers. And then Ethereum, the majority of hash rate is controlled by four mining pools. And Bitcoin, the majority of hash rate is also controlled by four mining pools. Uh, so you would expect that Ethereum and Bitcoin, if in fact you know EOS was more scalable because it's centralized, uh, around a certain small number of block producers, you'd expect Ethereum and Bitcoin to be more scalable, but they're not. Uh, and the reason for this is that number of nodes doesn't actually have anything to do with scalability because consensus is in fact not the bottleneck for blockchains. So what is the bottleneck? Uh, it's the social contract, it's not consensus. On Ethereum, we want non-consensus full nodes with a particular amount of hardware 
approximately a four core CPU, eight gigabytes of RAM, and an NVMe SSD to be able to fully validate the chain at a rate around 10 times as fast as it grows. Uh, in other words, it must be able to catch up. Uh, and mind you, these numbers aren't really hard coded or written down or codified anywhere. This is more uh, kind of a best guessed estimate uh, because you know this way of thinking about scaling bottlenecks is is kind of an idea that isn't very widely understood. Uh, on Bitcoin, you want non-consensus nodes, non-consensus full nodes, uh, with a Raspberry Pi amount of hardware and a hard disk drive. They need to be able to fully validate the chain at a rate, maybe let's say 30, 50 times as fast as it grows. Uh, so the parameters they choose here in terms of the, their nodes' hardware requirements, networking requirements, and how fast they want to be able to catch up to the chain are different. Uh, it's not necessarily better or worse compared to Bitcoin and Ethereum, because on Ethereum, you can still do this on a consumer hardware. And, you know, you don't need a Raspberry Pi. A laptop is sufficient. But EOS chooses something pretty different. It wants non-consensus full nodes with a 64-core CPU, one terabyte of RAM, rated NVMe SSDs, you know, super servers, essentially. They need to be able to fully validate the chain at a rate about one time as fast as it grows. In other words, not catching up at all. And this is kind of where the you know, EOS being centralized and Ethereum and Bitcoin not being centralized, or rather them being decentralized, comes in. Uh, you can't run an EOS full node on a regular uh, retail end user computer. You can do so for Ethereum and Bitcoin. So this is the bottleneck. We want to be able to increase scalability without increasing node hardware requirements. So that's the bottleneck. So how does this bottleneck kind of manifest into Ethereum being able to process only 15 transactions per second with much higher hardware requirements compared to Bitcoin's you know, three to seven uh, when Bitcoin can run on a Raspberry Pi? And the reason for this is EVM execution. Uh, Ethereum can process more complex transactions. You can you know, process stateful smart contracts, uh, as opposed to you know, Bitcoin's predicate scripts. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the reason that Ethereum can, is so slow is that it has to deal with state accesses and state growth. The Ethereum state size, in other words, all of the account balances and all of the contract storage slots are around 45 gigabytes. And this is why you need an NVMe SSD as opposed to a SATA SSD or a hard disk drive. Uh, because when you uh, actually execute a transaction, you have to make random accesses into the state to actually execute the transaction. And you can't fit 45 gigabytes into RAM. You have to put it on disk. In Bitcoin, the state is substantially smaller. It's around two gigabytes, last I checked. Uh, so it can easily fit into RAM. Or even if you put into a hard disk drive, uh, the state access patterns of the UTXO data model and Bitcoin in general are substantially better. So this is kind of how the bottleneck manifests in Ethereum. So you know we know the state accesses and state growth are the biggest problem. So rollups to the rescue. Uh, the rollup design paradigm is basically you put state and execution off chain and you use Ethereum only for data availability and processing uh, deposits and withdrawals from from this rollup side chain. Uh, and then you, how do you ensure that the state and execution has actually been done correctly? Uh, you can ensure the validity of these rollup blocks uh, using one of three methods. The first is validity or ZK proofs, and this is known as ZK rollups. Uh, the second thing is you note that you can actually replace any validity proof with a fraud proof plus a synchrony assumption. In other words, someone commits to a rollup block, you wait a period of time, say a week, uh, if no one has submitted a fraud proof within that period of time, then you just assume that the block is valid, and you and you and you move on, right? You finalize it, uh, and you can always replace validity proofs with this. So this system is called optimistic rollup. Uh, the third option is instead of using a single round fraud proof, uh, which you know resolves immediately in a single block in a single transaction, uh, you can use an interactive verification game plus a synchrony assumption, and this is what the guys at Offchain Labs are doing. So there's different schemes for ensuring uh, the validity of this, the execution that happens off-chain. So why can rollups scale? And there's a star here, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides. So with the rollups, uh, Ethereum consensus nodes, in other words, the miners, and also non-consensus nodes, the users, only need to make the data available in order. It. In, or, in other words, they download the data and they timestamp it. They don't actually have to execute the transactions inside the rollup blocks. 
And this is very powerful because there's no lower execution to no execution, right? Simply downloading data and then storing it in history does not touch the state at all. In other words, we've essentially solved the state growth and access problem at the Ethereum base layer. And this is how, how rollups can scale. So as I can, uh, and you'll often see, uh, or you may have seen, you know, comp calculations like this. You have 10 million gas per block. Each transaction in the rollup chain is about 100 bytes. Uh, call, the cost of call data, in other words, posting this you know, rollup block on chain, it's about 16 gas per byte. And you have 12 second block times. This gives you around 521 transactions per second. And you may have seen people say, hey, you can make an optimistic rollup that you know, gives you 500, 1,000, 10,000 transactions per second. Uh, but there's a catch here, which is that let's let's pretend that everyone was using a single optimistic rollup, and this optimistic rollup was using the EVM. Then we'd actually have zero scalability gains unless we want to increase user hardware and bandwidth requirements because you know, user full nodes would still have to execute every transaction in this rollup block to ensure it's valid. Uh, so you'd still be limited to 15 transactions per second inside the EVM. You know, just forking Geth and putting it inside a rollup doesn't magically make Geth more performant for the same hardware and bandwidth and for the same rate of catching up to chain growth. So in this, you know, in this case, I'm going to analyze optimistic rollups as opposed to ZK rollups because we note that the verification and block production for optimistic rollup is symmetric. So to be a full node, to be a validator, like a block producer and optimistic rollup, the, it costs exactly the same as being a user. Uh, they both have to verify every transaction. With the ZK rollup, the cost is asymmetric, and this is also a problem for you know succinct chains like Coda, for instance. Uh, which you know, into or any other chain that integrates actual zk proofs into block production, the cost is asymmetric. Uh, so this makes uh, the analysis of incentives and whatnot more complex. So in this case, we will you know only analyze optimistic rollups because it's more classical. Uh, the the cost is symmetric. So uh, what are kind of the unique benefits of optimistic rollups? Uh, you know, we said they can they can provide scale. Uh, you know, if they use them, if you use them incorrectly, if you have everyone using a single EVM rollup, then they don't provide any scalability. So, how would they provide scalability? And we can think of this kind of in the context of sharding, which is that uh, the way sharding works is that it provides uh, increased transactions per second because you have many execution threads running in parallel. You know, if you have 64 shards, you have 64 execution threads running in parallel. In other words, sharding provides scalability not because each shard has a smaller number of validators, but because you have many shards running in parallel. That's why. Uh, and we note that you know, rollups are optimistic rollups, and uh, they kind of act like a form of dynamic heterogeneous sharding. They're dynamic because you can spin up any number of shards. right? If you want to have an extra shard in this context, you can just spin up another rollup chain. You just apply a contract on chain, spin it up, Boom, you have another shard, if you want to call it that. They're also heterogeneous because each shard can have different execution. Uh, you're not bound by a single execution framework for all shards globally, like you would in, for example, E2 or in any other blockchain sharded system. In this case, it's heterogeneous. You know, you can do any execution system you want inside the rollup, so long as you can produce compact fraud proofs in the case of optimistic rollups. Uh, so this is interesting because it allows us to explore different execution and data models without hard forking the Ethereum chain. Uh, for example, you can have a UTXO data model just for payments and things like non-custodial exchanges and say this predicate execution. And this is what we're doing at Fuel Labs and what I'll discuss in a few slides. You could have a custom VM that's good specifically for interactive verification games. Uh, this is what the off-chain labs are doing. And you can compile EVM code to their virtual machine. Uh, if you want to run Libra's MoveVM, you know you don't want to modify Ethereum proper because MoveVM might be still experimental, but maybe you want to actually use it without leaving the Ethereum ecosystem and the money that goes that DeFi provides. Well, guess what? You can just put Libra's MoveVM inside uh, inside an optimistic rollup. Uh, you can also implement things like EVM with access lists and state rent. Uh, you know, maybe you like the EVM mostly, but you don't want to just put the EVM inside a rollup because then you'll be limited to 15 transactions per second. So why don't we add access list to the EVM so that you can do some multi-threaded computation, multi-threaded transaction execution, and maybe you can get from 15 to 60. Uh, and you know, all their various application-specific execution frameworks. 
if you have you know a particular set of dApps or contracts that want to interact together, uh, you might be able to develop execution frameworks specific to them that can be much more highly optimized than you know a generic EVM style system. These are kind of the benefits of optimistic rollups. So now let's talk about the fuel the rollup chain and how it kind of differentiates itself from all other optimistic rollup projects out there. So first of all, we use a UTXO data model as opposed to an accounts data model or anything like the EVM. Uh, and our focus is on stablecoin payments. So with the UTXO data model, you can transfer any token thanks to colored coins. So we support Ether and any ERC20 token, and in the future we'll support other token types. Thanks to the UTXO data model, you can also build non-custodial exchanges on top of Fuel. And we leverage an efficient fraud proof scheme, which I wrote about on ETH research over here on the right, uh, that allows you to create or to have fraud proofs efficiently without having to compute a state route after every transaction. Because computing a state route after every transaction is extremely expensive. Uh, the alternative to this is to do something like post, a state transition, post actual state transitions as opposed to posting the intermediate state route. Uh, the problem with this, of course, is that in the UTXO data model, is, you know, the, it's, it's equivalent to just posting the state transitions. So might as well use the UTXO data model in general. Uh, and even if you use the accounts data model, using that scheme would be quite expensive. So, uh, and third, instead of allowing general you know, stateful execution, we allow stateless predicate scripts, kind of like what Bitcoin allows. Uh, and this means it's extremely performant and uh, uh, the execution can be done in parallel. And this is kind of our design philosophy is that we want to enable parallelism. Uh, the UTXO data model, the use of stateless scripts, etc., cetera, uh, means that you have a much better state access pattern. Uh, it means that uh, you can easily get things like a thousand transactions per second on consumer hardware, believe it or not, uh, with proper parallelized execution and validation of transactions. So for us, unlike for other optimistic world projects, our bottleneck is very much the data availability throughput of Ethereum and not execution on a, a node. So uh, we, also, uh, we also prefer ease of use. Uh, if you have something like the EVM or any generic execution framework inside, uh, inside your rollup, you need a concept of gas. You need to meter the execution, uh, otherwise you can have denial of service attacks. Uh, so for the UTXO data model and stateless predicates, the nice thing is that the cost is always fixed. Uh, it's, it's known beforehand. You have, a, you have a predicate, you have some input. The cost of this is fixed. It never changes because it's stateless. Uh, therefore, you don't need a concept of gas. You don't need this kind of metering. Uh, fees can be determined much more easily. Uh, this makes it much easier for end users to use because they no longer need to set a gas, uh, gas limit and a gas price. They just set a single fee, just, at the, just as they would with Bitcoin. Uh, you can also think of uh, our rollup chain as meta-transactional, uh, where the rollup block producer can accept any token to pay fees, for instance, DAI, SAI, uh, you know, USDC, whatever you have, uh, and then pays the on-chain Ether fees, which means users can use the rollup chain without owning Ether and without having to speculate on the price of Ether. Uh, this is very good for mass adoption because you know the 6, 6 billion, 7 billion people that aren't in the crypto space Unlike us, they aren't degenerate gamblers. They don't like gambling and speculation. Uh, they would like potentially to just, you know, pay people. Uh, so having a system that's meta-transactional is, is good for mass adoption. <laughs> I have to laugh at that. That was brilliant, John. <laughs> it's a, it's a, you know, the other 7 billion people not being degenerate gamblers is a, is a phrase I use a lot because it's true. You know, here in the crypto space, you know, we very much like gambling you know there's exchanges there's this DeFi thing there's this loaning and so on and it, it all kind of boils down a lot to you know gambling and so on uh you know i just love i just love hearing somebody call a spade a spade that's all man it's just yeah <laughs> yeah uh although we will get to how you can gamble uh, we will get to how you can gamble a bit on fuel a bit later so uh, our paradigm from permissionlessness uh all roll-up chains need to be permissionless in some way uh, you need to be able to forcibly include uh, a transaction so that potentially, in the worst case, you're going to withdraw your funds from the rollup chain and you need to be able to do this permissionlessly. Uh, if you don't have this, then you end up in a system where essentially you have to post a withdrawal request on chain and then each withdrawal request needs to be individually challengeable 
and then it kind of degenerates to the channel-like system or this plasma-like system, and that's what we don't want. Uh, because that's not really resilient to chain congestion. We want a system that's resilient to chain congestion, uh, and because of that, we need a, we need it to be permissionless. Uh, so our paradigm for being permissionless is, in the happy case centralized, we'll just have a single operator, but we always allow fallback to full decentralization seamlessly. So in the case that us, or the operator, starts censoring transactions, starts you know doing weird reordering transactions, start creating in the block, something like that, you can always seamlessly and instantly fall back to full decentralization if you want to. And this is our paradigm. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, another interesting benefit of fuel. Uh, you can think of it as a meta finality layer. And what do I mean by this? I'll explain. So you may have heard weird statements like optimistic rollups allow instant, secure, trustless, zero confirmation tr transactions, or that an under collateralized bond is incentive compatible for allowing these zero confirmation of transactions. Uh, this is not actually true. Um, optimistic rollups and rollups in general don't allow instant transactions to be trustless. And the reason for this is the same reason that zero confirmation of transactions aren't trustless for regular blockchains, which is that the MEV or minor extractable value of zero confirmation transactions is unbounded since there's no maximum number of un unconfirmed transactions. Right? There's no block size cap on unconfirmed transactions. You can have an infinite, not, infinite number of them, uh, which means you can't make a system that's trustless or incentive compatible uh, in, in this situation. And the only way to do that, the only way to make it trustless and incentive compatible for unconfirmed transactions is you, if you have full collateralization. And the name for this is a channel. In other words, if you have a channel, of course you can have you know instant, instant, instant channel updates. That's the beauty of channels. They're an interactivity solution, not a scalability solution. Uh, so, you know, optimistic rollups don't allow trustless instant transactions, but can they allow trustless or trust minimized or incentive compatible one confirmation transactions? And the answer is, yeah, kind of, uh, because the MEV of a known on-chain rollup block is bounded. So if you have a single bond, uh, then this bond can be slashed in the case that the rollup operator equivocates, in other words, creates a conflicting block on a different Ethereum fork. So this means that uh, you can think of it like a meta finality layer on top of Ethereum, so that even if Ethereum does a short reorg of one or two or three blocks, the rollup operator promises to always produce the same rollup chain across all Ethereum forks, uh, or his bond will get slashed. And since you know the MEV of the on-chain block, because you can, you can see it, uh, and the size of this block is bounded, uh, it means that the system can actually work and be incentive compatible, which is nice because now it means exchanges no longer need 15 uh, confirmations for Ethereum blocks. They need one confirmation potentially if they use, say, fuel as a meta finality layer. Uh, and this, of course, doesn't apply just to exchanges, uh, you know, accepting withdrawals and deposits. Uh, this can also apply to, you know, any any merchant. Okay, so let's go over a few examples of what we have built with fuel over the past few months. Uh, so recently, just uh, last week, I believe we, uh, or maybe earlier this week, we unveiled the, uh, yeah, earlier this week, because it's the weekend now, we unveiled the Fuel Burner Wallet integration. So there's a screenshot here on the left. Uh, you may have used Burner Wallet at ETH Global events uh, before, and it's it has previously been powered by I think POA Network, uh, which is okay if you want to do something like uh, you know you're just transferring you know tokens to buy. You know, you know, coupons or whatever, coupon, tokenized coupons to buy stuff from food trucks at an event. That's great, but it's not really great if you want to actually transfer real money uh, because you don't want a trusted sidechain to handle real money, right? You want the sidechain to be trust, trustless or trust minimized. That's what rollups do. Uh, so with this burner wall integration, it means that, you know, for now, their demo isn't fake die, but eventually you can do systems like this and transfer real money uh, with a good user experience. And you can actually try out the demo. It's at burner.fuel.sh. Uh, so what are some further use cases of our optimistic rollup chain? So the you know, simplest use case is payments, uh, as, as you hopefully discerned by now. Uh, specifically, we're targeting stablecoin payments because we note that the you know, average you know, seven, seven billion, 7 billion uh, people in the world, uh, they, want, they would like to be able to you know, make payments potentially globally. 
uh, without having to go through KYC, uh, without having to do, do, do all this hassle, and without having to be exposed to the volatility of crypto, uh, so they can make stablecoin payments uh, uh, through Fuel. Uh, additionally, they could do things like onboard directly from systems like Paytree, which is in Canada, uh, which allows you to essentially purchase DAI using Canadian dollars, and then that can be onboarded directly onto Fuel, uh, so that users never have to deal with the uh, complexities of gas uh, and so on, unless they want to actually use Ethereum for its smart contracts. If they only want to make payments, then they don't have to be exposed to the complexity of gas. Other things you can build on top of Fuel are non-custodial exchanges. Uh, the UTXO data model happens to be very handy because you can do something like construct a transaction uh, where two users or potentially more users uh, will exchange funds. And this happens atomically and trustlessly. Uh, you can also have things like decentralized social networks. Uh, and this is especially useful in the context of, like I said above, that you know users don't want to be exposed to gas. So you can build systems like replacements of, to Twitter, to Reddit, and Facebook, and so on. You can build these, these on top of Fuel, uh, just you know, pending data strings into a data field in the transaction. You know, it's kind of like op return for Bitcoin, just with without a limit of 50 bytes. You know, now there's no limit. Uh, the limit is only whatever you know the Ethereum block size is, which I think is several hundred kilobytes for an Ethereum block. But don't quote me on that. Uh, you know, Fuel can also serve as a base for channel or payment and state channel networks. Uh, instead of having to go back to the main Ethereum chain where it could potentially be expensive to close a channel, you can instead open a channel and then later on close it directly on top of the Fuel chain. And with minor extensions, which we're planning in the future, uh, you can actually, interestingly enough, also have general purpose smart contracts. Uh, and the way this works is that if you have scripts with covenants, and state introspection. This is equivalent to general purpose execution like the EVM with strict access lists and enforced SSA or static state access. Uh, for those of you who are wondering, the general idea around ETH1X to ETH2 transition, uh, that whole thing, they're very much planning to do things like enforcing strict access lists and enforcing SSA execution. Uh, so it turns out that you can actually run this directly with the very minor extensions to our current system, uh, which we're going to be uh, pushing out over the coming months. So you'll essentially be able to code all the contracts that you would be able to code on E2, you can code them on Fuel and run them on this you know, extended version of Fuel. Oh yeah, so now let's talk about, you know, more short term, let's talk about DeFi and Fuel. Uh, you know, you can use this, you know, Fuel is not uh, completely divorced from the current DeFi ecosystem. You can use systems like Compound and Chai and Maker on top of Fuel. Uh, you know, you can use Dai, for instance. You can use C Dai and so on. You can use them on top of Fuel and still get the benefits from there. Uh, but does Fuel itself allow any new DeFi applications on top of it? And the answer is actually yes. It allows one very interesting one, in fact, uh, which is. Uh, you may have, you may remember, you know, back many slides ago, I said any validity proof can be replaced with a fraud proof and a synchrony assumption. Right? The synchrony assumption is someone submits a roll-up block on, ch on chain, you wait the timeout period. If a fraud proof hasn't been submitted, then the block finalizes. Uh, so that means that, w so the way, the way this works, for those of you who aren't familiar, is that withdrawals can only be done from finalized blocks. Uh, what this means is that you have to wait this timeout period to withdraw your funds from the optimistic roll-up chain. And this is an issue in quotes for any optimistic roll-up chain. Well, it turns out there's a very simple solution to this, which is that you just have a liquidity you have a liquidity provider network uh, that allows you to allows users to immediately through atomic swaps withdraw their funds in potentially as little as one block, uh, and the user only needs to pay essentially you know a small fee to the liquidity provider uh, to allow this. Uh, so what this means is that. You can have people that just have a lot of money sitting around there, but you know maybe they don't like things like the risk of lending. You know because these protocols aren't risk-free. Well, it turns out that the, you can actually have these people provide liquidity for instant withdrawals from optimistic roll chains such as Fuel, uh, and this allows them to get uh, you know returns on having liquidity completely risk-free. There's completely risk-free returns, uh, unlike lending protocols where there might be some risk. So this is a new DeFi uh, application that we're going to be working on and shipping in the next few months. 
Uh, so be be tuned for that. Oh yeah. So now let's talk a little bit. You know, to wrap up, let's talk about about beyond sharding. Uh, you know, what happens if we want to go beyond the data availability throughput provided to us by uh, current sharding schemes? So we note that sharding provides a constant factor increase in transactions per second. In the ideal case, maybe. Uh, you can look at least authorities' recent audit of the E2.0 specs to see why that's a maybe. Uh, you know, sh you know, if you have a 64 shards, then you get a 64x increase in throughput, uh, which is, you know, it's amazing compared to current Ethereum. Uh, but can we actually do better than a constant factor increase? And the answer is actually yes, we can. Imagine if we had a system that was a data availability layer. Uh, so the only thing the chain did was just order transactions and make them available, just order data. Uh, and all the execution happened client side. Uh, the nice thing is we can exploit sublinear data availability checks, and these checks actually scale with the number of users. Uh, so you can actually increase the block size securely. Uh, the block size here in this case is purely data availability throughput. You can increase this securely as you add more users, and this is a unique property among all blockchains. So if you'd like to know more about this project, you can check out Lazy Ledger. So to to conclude, uh, where to find us? You can Tweet us on Twitter at, at fuellabs underscore. Our website is fuel.sh. And our GitHub is uh, the Fuel Labs organization, where we have several repositories, both for our core JavaScript client and for burner wallet integration and our uh, JavaScript SDK and so on. So that's it. Thanks for having me. I see one person says, so for a full stack, Fuel would need a data layer and a VM. Yeah. So. The way Fuel and you know general optimistic rollups work is that you have some place to put data and some place to execute the two-way bridge, you know, deposits and withdrawals. Uh, and these things don't actually have to be in the same chain. Uh, they could be the data layer, for instance, could be in a different chain. Uh, but yeah, in general, they have those two things. And then you also have when you do off-chain execution, you need some sort of virtual machine specification, and you need to be able to execute fraud proofs based on this virtual machine inside the two-way bridge executor. So, you know, in our case, our, our virtual machine is pretty simple. It just, you know, you have UTXOs, they transfer, and that's, and you do maybe some stateless execution with predicates on there. Uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, I hope that, I hope that answers your question. So, yeah, so you need data, you do need a data layer, you do need a VM specification because you need to be able to execute fraud proofs based on that VM specification inside Ethereum. Uh, yeah. Awesome. John, thank you so much for joining. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for organizing this great uh, conference in the wake of this disaster, this global disaster. <laughs>